Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Bitwig Studio and Music Production. This is lesson number 10, Fundamentals of Sound number 1, Amplitude and Amplitude Envelopes. So we have reached the 10 lesson mark. We're in double digits at this point, or maybe the last one was actually double digits because we started with lesson 00. zero. But I just want to make one quick point, and then we're going to begin this lesson, and that's don't worry that we're not in Bitwig Studios yet. Learning some of the stuff that we're covering right now is going to help you so much more than if I had just skipped over all of this stuff and moved into Bitwig. I know moving forward with some of my tutorial videos, some of them are probably going to be more popular than others, but really my hope would be that all of my videos have the same number of views across the board. I don't really care if that's a high number or a low number. I just want to know that you guys are actually trying your best to go through these in order. And I know some of these topics are pretty dry and pretty lame, but if you're going to be working with digital audio, and obviously you really care about it if you're watching these videos, then it is pretty important to go through all these topics because especially with these fundamentals of sound video, when we start doing some synthesis and maybe attempting to recreate some sounds that we hear that we enjoy, then you're going to realize just how important these concepts are and that I'll be going back to these again and again without fail. And it's helpful to know that you've covered these things and already understand them so that you're not just following along and copying what I do exactly. You'll be able to go off on your own, analyze the sound yourself, and then go about trying to recreate it. The other thing I want to mention is I do have a playlist that has all these videos. So um, I'm kind of new to the whole YouTube thing, so hopefully I've gotten this to work out properly. So if you go to my channel here, and then you go to playlists, you can open up this Bitwig Studio and Music Production playlist, and it has them all, and it has them all playing in order, which I think could be pretty helpful. So let's jump into this right away, because I know all of my videos tend to go pretty long for some reason. I'm trying to cut back, but I hope you guys enjoy all the examples I do uh, really, it's very easy to uh, just explain a concept and move on, but I think some of the visual examples might help some of you. Um, and so if you guys really hate the length of these videos, you can post in the comments and I'll try to make them shorter. Anyway, let's begin with a definition of amplitude from Wikipedia, which states the amplitude of a periodic variable is a measure of its change over a single period, such as time or spatial period. Okay, that's great for us. We're going to be dealing with volume and or loudness. And so what amplitude is, it's the periodic variable of that volume over time, or I should say volume is the periodic variable and it's being measured over a given amount of time. So think about the real world right now. Every single sound you hear, except for one that I'm going to show you in an example, typically has some sort of variation in its volume. My voice right now is jumping all over the place. Somebody slams a door, there's a length to that sound, and it's changing. The volume of that is changing. So there's that initial whoosh of the door being closed and the slam sound, and then whatever sort of reverberation comes after that slam. And that's actually going to be referred to as the envelope of the sound, but I'm gonna be showing you guys a picture and we'll be getting into that in much more depth as we move on. But amplitude could also be referring to the duration of an entire track. And we're going to be looking at that too to see how is it that a song that we like can have such a profound effect on us. And one of those is the fact that that song a lot of times is varying in its volume from section to section. So maybe the hook is a little bit louder than the chorus. Maybe there's a kick drum in the song that's especially resonant with us because it sustains, it's really boom, and holds as, a, as compared to just like a boom, 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 boom. Maybe it's a variation of the two, okay? And then that's why we really enjoy it, or maybe it's why we don't enjoy it. So we're going to be talking about all of that in this video. Uh, just as a quick reminder on loudness here, let's read the Wikipedia once again. Loudness is the characteristic of a sound that is primarily a psychological correlate of physical strength. More formally, it is defined as that attribute of auditory sensation in terms of which sounds can be ordered on a scale extending from quiet to loud. So remember, loudness is all relative to you 
as a person. So what you consider to be loud, what you consider to be quiet. For the most part, we can kind of agree when things are quiet or loud, but it's that uniqueness of being a human being that means that there is going to be a variation for every single person. I'm probably going to end up using the terms amplitude, loudness, and volume interchangeably in this video, but do be aware that there are subtle differences. For this lesson, I'm going to be working in Ableton Live, and the only reason I'm working in Ableton Live is because I have access to the oscilloscope plugin that I showed you guys and that I showed wasn't really working in Bitwig for whatever reason. I still haven't figured out why I can't get this plugin to work in there, but it's an incredibly useful tool for our next three or four lessons. Apart from that, we may not be pulling to it again for quite a while, but that's the reason I'm working in Ableton and everything else that I'm going to show you here, you could just as easily do in Bitwig. And for the most part, it's done the same way. I've also loaded up the span plugin here, which I showed you guys before. So you could also um, load this up in Bitwig and use it for the examples that may be, or experiments that you guys want to undertake. So let's get started. We're going to start with a sound that's not very natural in the real world. And let's focus only on dynamics. So let's focus on the changes in volume or the relative volume over a period of time. Here's my first example, and it's going to be the sine wave. I'm going to make some changes on this smexoscope so you can see what's going on. The oscilloscope is going to actually show you what the waveform looks like in real time, and then I can make some zoom adjustments, and I can freeze it and other stuff. So let's just play it for a second, and I'm going to make my changes over here, and I might freeze it briefly. So here we go. Let's see if I can get a better uh, picture here without that click. Okay, perfect. So the first thing that you're probably noticing about that sound is that there is a click. And so that actually is adding a perceived level to the dynamics. But the only reason it's clicking is because my um, loop in here isn't 100% perfect. Okay. And um, otherwise, you wouldn't really be hearing that click if I just let it play and I just let it stop. So here is the image of the sound of the waveform that we're just playing, the sine wave, which is not something that you're ever going to find in nature. It's only something you can really do um, with some kind of hardware. So either with an actual physical tone generator or with one that's a software model. And I use the one in Bitwig to generate this particular sine wave. What you're going to notice is if I pull up the span here and I click play, you're actually going to see some additional harmonics, but that's because this thing has been modeled probably after a real tone generator. And even a real tone generator is not probably going to be able to make an absolutely perfect sine wave. So let's play it in the span. And I want you guys to watch for any sort of volume modulation you see. Frequency is going to be on the X scale here going across and volume is going to be on the Y. So let's just play this for about 10 seconds and then you can make up your own mind as to what's happening. So apart from that click, nothing is really happening. And I tried to make this right at 440 hertz, which you can see as I'm going left and right, the, uh, you can see the hertz value up there changing. But basically, apart from the click, nothing is happening. It's just staying all the same from the second I click play to the second I click stop. So in this particular example, there really is no, there are no dynamics. The one thing I could change, though, is just the volume. So let's click play again. And now I'm going to take my volume slider and just pull it up. And so now you see our volume has gotten louder, but it still isn't really changing over time. When I was making that transition, it was. But now if I just click stop and I was to play it again, it's obviously just going to be at that same level for as long as I let this clip play out. 
Now imagine if everything you heard sounded like that, all just flat all the way through. It wouldn't be very interesting. And that's why dynamics are so important in the music you make. Okay, we're going to talk about this in, in relation to full songs too, but even with every single hit, every single instrument that you have in your track, apart from maybe you just have a sine wave going on at one consistent um, level throughout your track. But other than that, everything is going to have some kind of dynamics. It's going to have an envelope, which is basically how the sound changes or an amplitude envelope specifically, how the sound changes in its duration. So let's take a look at a couple of real world um, instruments here. We'll start with the piano. And so I've sampled a couple of different instances. I've taken a very soft hit on the piano. So anyone who actually plays piano, you know how you can play it dynamically, which is you can play it louder or you can play it softer. The reason the piano was first called the forte piano it literally meant loud, soft. It meant that the instrument had the ability to play both soft and loud, which was a huge deal at the time when the piano was invented. Um, originally, sorry about that, guys. I had a total mind fart there. Uh, before the piano was invented, they used a harpsichord, which was had a similar sound but it had absolutely no dynamics. So no matter how hard or how lightly you would strike the key, um, the way the mechanism would work is it would strike the string with the mallet at exactly the same amount of force, which case leading to the same sort of envelope every single time you would hit the key. There's still an envelope because the sound still has a portion where it gets sharper or louder and then it still is going to decay away. Um, but it would be the same for every note, regardless of how soft or how loud you hit it. So let's take a listen to this piano uh, soft strike real quick. I have this down um, at its original value. One more time again. And let's compare that to what it sounds like when you absolutely demolish the key. Here we go. All right, and the next thing I wanna do is I wanna to try to get these to relative levels really quick. Okay, so this is down pretty low. Let's, let's boost it up quite a bit. Maybe bring this one down just a little bit. Let's click play here. And the hard one. Eh, this one needs to go down a lot more, doesn't it? Let's do it one more time. Okay, so that's pretty close. And we're focusing specifically on the variation amplitude. So I know it just sounds different, which is true. Anybody who plays piano, you know what it sounds like when you lightly tap a key as compared to strongly tapping a key. But what we're concerned about is what this wave shape looks like. And you're gonna have to look kind of close, but what I want you guys to notice is this portion here, this for first per portion up until the highest point in the waveform or the quote unquote loudest point in the waveform, the, the area with the most intensity is referred to as the, the, the attack. And for our purposes, we're gonna say that from the attack to the end of the sound is the decay, which is actually true. Um, there are other points in an amplitude envelope, but we're not gonna worry about those for right now. So this is what the soft strike looks like. And let's look at the hard strike. Okay, there's a much more defined loud portion here. And that has to do with the fact when you really strike a key hard, you're gonna get more of that mallet on string sound. You're actually gonna get more of a flap kind of sound out of the piano. And you can use that to your advantage a lot of times when you are playing the piano. And let's just look really quickly at what an envelope specifically is, but I hope you guys can see the difference here. And so when you do play it, you're gonna hear more of a striking sound at the start as compared to this more muted version. One more time, just for fun. Okay, so even if their levels are 
as close as we can get them by just changing volume, there is going to still be a difference in that amplitude envelope in the attack and in the decay uh, stages of the sound. So let's look at this website. It's very helpful. I'll link to it in um, the video description, but here's an image for you so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Uh, the attack stage is how long it takes to get to the peak in the waveform, or if it's an actual natural sound, just how long it takes to go from the attack to the loudest point. And then the decay is from that peak all the way to the end. So every sound for the most part, at least anything you encounter in the real world, is gonna have some kind of attack and decay. Like sometimes you might have to really zoom in to see it, but every sound can't just start at a loud point. Every sound has to start from relatively nothing. So you can see here, even though the attack on the piano is, is pretty much instantaneous, there's still a bit of time it takes to get there, okay? And I hope you guys can see that here. And let's look at it live inside of the um, smexoscope here. I'm not sure if I have my zooms right, but we're gonna be able to see a bit of a difference, I think. So let's, maybe we should use the one on the master so I can keep my settings the same. This actually probably isn't gonna work. Okay, here we go. All right, let me try to get a better setting. Not good enough. We can maybe boost it a wee bit more. Good, okay, so what you can see there is that attack stage and then it slowly fading out. I wonder what happens if I mess with the time parameter. Good, so that's actually gonna go through it a little slower so you can really see what's going on. All right, and let's compare that. I'm gonna copy and paste this exact version over to the other channel. Let's see what happens when we hit the soft one. It's gonna look very similar, but there are subtle differences in the attack and decay portions. And I hope you guys could see them when we zoomed in there on the waveforms. I'm gonna also go through the strings real quick. I may not, um, maybe we'll use the span to show these. I don't wanna go through every single example here showing you the smexoscope and the span. Needless to say, all of these sounds, every sound that you're gonna encounter is gonna have a slightly different amplitude envelope. And so here is our sustaining string sound. Let's take a listen to it and watch what happens in the spectrum analyzer we have. So remember, we're more concerned about what's happening on the y-axis, how it's going up and how it's coming down. Just for your information, all of the notes that I've played here are simply an A note on the, uh, on the piano or for the various instrument we're using. So here we go, this is a sustaining sound of a string. Oop. Okay, let's watch it one more time all the way through. Here we go. So it's going to come up in volume and then come down when I release it. Okay, this isn't going incredibly fast, but we can also take a look at it inside of the smexoscope to see what's going on. Let's see what it looks like in here. Sorry guys, one more time. There we go. So you can see those, gra those uh, gradual amplitude changes. Let's compare that to the uh, sforzando here. And basically that's just a, um, that's just a sudden change in the dynamics. So it's gonna get really loud and then soft. So I'll talk about this in a minute, but with classical instruments and classical music and with sort of your more um, ordinary orchestral instruments that you're gonna see and that maybe some of you play, um, there's a lot that you can do with them dynamically to make them play louder, to make them play softer, and then specifically for the en envelope to do things over time. So. Let's take a look at this waveform. You can see what's going to happen when I play it now. 
So there's that attack stage and then decay and it's happening very quickly. One more time. And again, we can look at it in our various devices. And in the span, which isn't going incredibly fast, I could actually adjust it, but for now, we'll just keep it as it is. Awesome. So watch again for that peak. Watch how high the peak gets on the y-axis. All right, that's about where the peak was. And then you can see how it's going to gradually, um, or in this case, pretty quickly decrease as it's decaying away. Uh, next up is staccato. You guys all know what staccato sounds like. Whoops. Click the wrong thing. So let's take a listen. So there's that sort of classic plucky sound with a stringed instrument. This is actually done with the bow and pizzicato is going to be with the finger. So again, we can just look at this. I'm sure you guys are getting the point at, at this stage, but it is interesting to look at every single instrument and see actually any single sound. It doesn't have to just be an instrument. It could be anything. Uh, like I was saying at the beginning, like a door slamming or birds chirping. You could look at all of these things. You can look at all of these waveforms and be able to figure out the amplitude envelope just by looking at them and the, the various dynamics that they might have within them. So let's look at it on the smexoscope as well. Cool, that gives a really good example of a very quick attack and a very, very quick decay. And last but not least, pizzicato, a little more action going on here because it actually requires your finger to pluck the string. And so your finger is going to be um, on that string just a little bit longer than the bow is. And there's gonna be that snapback effect that's gonna happen here. Very cool, so again, we could zoom in and look at the attack stage and then the decay. And I guess just because we've showed it to you and all the other ones before, I'll show it one more time. And the span. Cool. So what does this mean for us moving forward? Well, it means a couple of things. Number one, we now know how to analyze any kind of sound for its relative dynamics over time. The other thing is if we really look closely at these we should be able to recreate them using an amplitude envelope of our own. So I've gone ahead and done that here with the sine wave. And what I've done is using a envelope, a volume envelope, I've adjusted it. So I've adjusted it to attack and decay. So where originally we started with just a straight sound all the way across, let's listen to what this one sounds like here with this slow, gradual ramp up and then a pretty quick ramp down. Oops. Let's do it one more time. Okay, so that kind of mimics what we had going with our sustaining string sound. If I wanted to, if I could, I could make this sine wave a lot longer and I could literally duplicate what's going on here if I just listened closely enough. So if we can do that with um, our sine wave, could we also maybe do something more of a staccato or a pizzicato? Let's take a listen and see what I've done with the amplitude envelope. So I've made a quick attack and then a pretty sudden decay. Let's take a listen. You guys can hear that. So obviously in terms of its sound, its timbral qualities, and also, well actually I think the pitch is the same, but in terms of the timbral qualities, we're not the same. And the reason for that is I'll just show you guys the span here. The sine wave again is only gonna have that one fundamental frequency and go down. And if we compare that to the staccato, you're gonna see that there's a whole lot more going on here. So there's all of that, and all we have in our sound is that one frequency, but the amplitude envelope is almost identical. So we're on our way to replicating that string sound. We've got the first part out of the way, which is adjusting the amplitude. Now, let's just show you guys one more example, and I'm gonna use the human voice as the example as 
which is pretty much the most complicated waveform there is. So let me just hit the record button here and I need to actually back up away from my microphone and we'll use my own voice as the example. This is an example of the human voice and its very complex amplitude structure. Okay, perfect. So I can look at this waveform and just look at that. It's bouncing all over the place, all right? This is something that I can't really replicate with my sine wave. I guess I could if I just wanted to make like a million points along the way and just, you know, keep looking and seeing. But the human voice is incredibly complex and it's incredibly nuanced. And it's one of the reasons why we're able to speak with so much emotion and so much articulation. So if we just listen back to what I did and let's run it through these plugins as well. First of all, let's look at it in the span because you're gonna see just how complicated this uh, waveform is. Let's click play. This is an example of the human voice and its very complex amplitude structure. So from that, you could see just how much variation there was in the amplitude and also in the frequency. Even though you probably couldn't hear too much frequency variation, it was still going on constantly. And that's just how complicated this uh, particular waveform is. Let's also show it in the uh, smexoscope. This is an example of the human voice and its very complex amplitude structure. Let me play it one more time and just this notice. This is an example of the human voice Whoa. and its very complex amplitude structure. Okay, perfect. It's gonna just keep looping once I stop it. But what I hope you guys notice there is as I was just tapping the freeze madly, we were getting totally different shapes every single time. So there isn't really a whole lot of logic to it. Different shapes and also different values on the Y plane as well. So at some points it was up here, sometimes it was very low down here. And even in this one little snippet of time, there's a whole lot going on here. Okay, so I just wanted to show you guys the human voice because it is incredibly complex and it's something that with a normal synthesizer and synthesis, we're not really going to be able to recreate very easily. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, early voice technology and computers is so robotic sounding because it's very difficult to master the nuance of the human voice. Companies are trying to do it right now, and it might get to the point where you could talk to a sales representative on the phone who's just a, a total robot and you wouldn't even know it. But for now, it's still pretty easy to know when you're talking to something that's automated because when you do talk to something that's automated and not uh, self-aware, you know, it's just going to repeat phrases if you give it something that it doesn't understand. But probably in the future, we'll get to a point where we'll have no idea if we're talking to a human being or to some kind of robot on the other end. But for now, we don't have to worry about that. And our voice and our nuances and articulations and dynamics are so complicated that it's very difficult to replicate. Okay, I want to talk about full tracks now. I'm not gonna be able to play these again, but I will show you the tracks that we're playing. I'm gonna talk about each of them just a little bit. And I wanted to start with this Wagner track, and this one I'm actually gonna play because since it was composed like in 1859, I should be able to play it without any copyright problems, but I've said that before and I've gone burned. So let's focus specifically on amplitude. Okay, taking a look at this already, you can see what's going on here. And I'm gonna play up until this first little big burst of sound, but listen to how the variations in amplitude are building tension. And as you can tell, that tension is building all the way up until this huge climax point. This is, uh, I'll just show you guys what this is. This is Wagner's Tristan und Isolde, the prelude. This is, this is an opera, and I really encourage you guys to check it out. Um, obviously, Wagner is still kind of a very controversial figure, figure for his politics 
and everything else, but his music is phenomenal. And it's something that we could just spend hours and hours talking about for why it's so important and what makes it so interesting. But for now, let's just listen to this and focus on the dynamics. Let's focus in those changes in volume over time. So if that doesn't make my point, I have no idea what will. Um, Wagner is an incredible composer for a number of reasons, but for what we're focusing on in Amplitude, just notice how those builds, those rises, that silence, it adds so much to this piece and adds so, so much tension. And even when it releases at that loud point that we got to in the track, um, there still isn't resolution. And there's a reason for that, which I don't know if we're ever going to cover. I'm not sure if I really want to get into scales and key signatures and complex harmony theory too much. But needless to say, just the amplitude variations alone are enough to, to write home about. And if you want, I encourage you to listen to the whole track and just kind of listen for those changes. And I want to answer the question a lot of you are having, which is why in classical music... Do we see things like this, or this is actually a romantic piece, but you guys get my point. Why do we see a waveform like this, yet just recently we see music that's been mastered like this? And we've already talked about it a little bit, but let me just talk about a little bit the reasoning for why you're going to see music like this. The big thing to remember is that in the days of having to write for a limited number of instruments and all acoustic real-world instruments, there's not a ton of variations you can call for. There's not an unlimited number of sounds to draw upon. So I showed you guys all the different sounds you can make with the strings, but that's still a limited number. And some violin players and some string players are going to be more hesitant to do some of the things that composers want them to do because it could potentially damage their instruments. But even assuming you have people who are fully on board with what you want as a composer, you're still going to be limited, okay? So you only have those acoustic instruments that are available to you, and so you write for those instruments. Well, with electronic music, like we have today, and like this is an example of electronic music, we have an unlimited number of sounds to choose from. With synthesizers and complex effects processing, we have so much that we could potentially choose from that these composers just didn't have those options for. So what did they do? Well, they used what they had. And one of those tools was dynamics throughout an entire song. One of the tools was dynamics. And so you could vary the 
the loudness, right? You could vary the amplitude over time. And a lot of classical pieces are going to have a very interesting structure when you look at the waveforms because there's times where they want to build tension and so they'll use silence. And then when it gets to the climax, boom, everything in super loud in your face. And it's going to make those loud parts seem louder and those quiet parts seem quieter. We talked about dynamic range before and how that works. So I want to start with that track from 1859. And one thing you can do, of course, is take tracks from each era and kind of see how their waveforms vary. The next thing I want to show you is uh, this track by Jewel. Yes, I do like Jewel. Um, she has a very beautiful voice and um, her music is going to be good for this example. So this is a song called You Were Meant For Me. I'm not going to play it, but I highly encourage you guys to listen to these. And I wish I could put this into the arrangement view and, and explain to you exactly what's going on. But let's take a look at this waveform here. And what we're going to notice is that there are different areas of amplitude. Okay, so here is obviously the introduction. And it looks like here maybe some kind of percussion instrument is coming in because there's a really, really sharp attack. So maybe there's a kick drum of some kind. Then the volume picks up again. So I'm guessing another instrument is brought in or maybe this is um, a, a part where she's building with her voice. And then boom, we get to a very loud section. And just from having gone through this and listened to this, this here is um, the first verse, this section here. And then here is going to be your chorus. So logically, what's the part that you want people to remember the most? Well, you want it to be the chorus section. So it makes sense that it's going to be a little bit louder. And so throughout this track, you can see those variations and you can actually kind of predict what's going on. And here's a bridge. So this is the point in the track where she's trying to build the most tension, trying to get the most emotion out of you as the listener, because it's the point from which we're going to go to the lowest valley to then a very high peak again. Okay, so you really should listen to this song and you're going to understand what I mean and how you can get a lot of emotion out of a track like this. Uh, the other example that I want to show is this live version. I just ripped this off of YouTube, so I'll link to it again in the description. And notice just how wide a dynamic range there is in a live performance. So she's not constrained to the studio in this case. There's not a whole lot of processing. I think there's a little bit of processing to make sure that she doesn't clip and distort the whole uh, sound system there. But she's just performing at this point with an acoustic guitar and her voice. And having those, just those two things means she's going to have a whole lot of freedom and a lot of choices to vary her dynamics as she sees fit. And it's the exact same song but it looks totally different. And the, and the emotional experience of listening to it is totally different. I don't know the last time I've gotten chills when listening to a song that's been totally mixed and mastered in a studio that's designed for radio play. But I can tell you listening to a live performance like this, it can give you chills pretty easily. And so um, I want you guys to listen to the difference between those two if you have time. We're running really long in this video and I want to talk about this last track a little bit. But let's look at something from 2011. This is uh, a Skrillex track. It's uh, this one here. I was going to click on the one with the actual music video, but it just freaks me out too much. So this is just the audio one here. Obviously, Skrillex is playing with dynamics a little bit differently. He's making things really loud, but you can see how sharp of peaks there are on these kick drums. And so let's remember that kick drums in themselves can have dynamics. So there's the full level of the track and then there's the individual parts too. So this is a very sharp, very, very heavy kick drum and it's been super compressed, um, which I'll talk about that more when we get there. And let's talk <laughs> about this one section here in the track. It's kind of funny because like we said before, there's this idea in making a music track to kind of take your listener on a journey to build suspense, to add tension, to release that tension a little bit. Um, and so what he's done here is try to give your ears a huge change up by going from something that's been limited and compressed to 
God knows where, down to something a lot quieter. And perceptually, this is going to be a huge difference when you've been listening to this really slammed audio for a long time. Uh, the one thing is, midway through this little breakdown, there is this like loud part that comes in, which I, I don't really understand the reasoning for that at all, other than to, I guess, make you crap your pants or spill your coffee. And then obviously, boom, we come into the hardest hitting part of the track right here. So this is still part of a build. And then obviously, you guys know with dubstep, we're going to build and then we're going to go into a crazy breakdown and everybody's going to lose their mind. So I thought I'd show you just the difference from 59, 1859, 1995, 2006 live performance, 2011 Skrillex. Okay, another example here of more of a club track. I consider Skrillex's music to be more pop. It's structured like a pop song. Um, I know it's dance music, but there's a difference in how you arrange it. So this is a very DJ-friendly deep house track, which I'll link to again. It's by um, Jay West, and it's called Music Drives Her Wild. You can even see the waveform file here on Beatport. And what you're going to notice with a club type track is a very similar waveform almost all the time. So there's going to be some kind of intro, usually just drums to make life easier for a DJ. It's going to build, it's going to build. Um, right here when it gets louder, I think the bass is finally going to come in. Uh, and that's and the bass takes up a lot of room. We're going to explain that in the next video about how frequencies work. But obviously it's building, it's building, it's building. Oh, okay, we have a bit of a drop here. And then we're going to build again, a little mini drop, and then one final sort of um, main hook region here towards the end of the track. And then it's going to slowly break down until just drums to help the DJ out again. And again, you can see here the very defined dynamics in these percussion and drum hits. So it would be really easy to just go in here and just like sample out one of these hits if you wanted to use them in one of your, your own productions. But um, that's how a club track is going to typically be arranged. That's how the dynamic dynamics are going to go. It's going to range and kind of build up, come back down, build up again, come down, then build up for some kind of grand finale. The last track I wanted to show you, which is perhaps the most interesting, is the track by Girls' Generation uh, called I Got a Boy. I'm sure many of you guys have heard it. Again, it's unfortunately been, well, maybe not unfortunately, but it has been limited and compressed to hell so we can't really see dynamics within these main sections but uh, this is the song here and i wanted to talk about k-pop and, and j-pop a little bit but i've obviously run way out of time so if somebody wants me to do a longer video on the styles of those particular types of music just let me know and i will do it because it's very fascinating to me but the interesting thing you have going on here is what i would call sort of instant tension and instant release, meaning that the track is going all over the place. And this is literally probably the most crazy song I have ever heard in my whole life, uh, which I'm saying as a good thing, but let's bring it in and screw it. I'm going to play some clips just to try to make my point with this with this track because it, it really is, I think when we look at, at Wagner and sort of, um, excuse me, when we look at Wagner and these slow builds and sort of the way that he releases tension to the way the girls' generation do it, it's so radically different, but it can be just as effective. So, for example, here, this is the start of the track. Hey, yo, G My God. This is a little loud. Hey, yo, GG! Hey, yo, GG! Right, so we start with something that's still pretty loud, but then we're gonna have this really, really short buildup. Okay, let's play this short little buildup. Into the first big drum hits here. So let's listen to this. Okay, and they're gonna do this multiple times. So let's go to this next little, little drop and build. I find this actually very fascinating. Let's take a listen. <laughs> and the other thing about J-pop and K-pop, I'm not gonna go into detail, but basically it's hook-driven music the way that it's written. And so this, I don't know how many 
different instrument tracks they had going on. I can't imagine that they were able to make this song in, in Pro Tools. I just don't know how you could do it. It must have been done like in Logic or in Live because there, there must have been hundreds and hundreds of tracks for this one. So let's again look for another spot here where we're going to have a dropout. Here's one. And these are going, these happen all the time in this track, which unless you zoom in, you're just gonna probably see the brick wall effect. But let's hear, what's this one? Yeah. Uh, not really a good example, but it is changing sounds here and sound styles. Okay, where's the one that I wanna show you guys? I don't think it's this one. No, okay. Don't worry, I'm going to find what I'm looking for so I can show you. It's around here on the, the uh, waveform, so. Pull it up so I can, ah, here we go. Okay, so I just want you guys to listen to this and focus specifically on the dynamics and what happens here. No time, no hey, you stop. Let me put it down another way. One more time, because this is very, profound in something that you're going to be finding and seeing in pop music quite frequently. One more time. No time, no, so hey, you stop. Let me put it down another way. Okay, so let me just explain why this is going to work in a track like this and why it's going to be very poppy and it's going to keep our interest going through. So if we have a loud section going for a while as we have here, Okay, a number of bars. And then we cut out to something that's much quieter perceptually and that's not as complex as we have here. In this case, it's a human voice too, where for most of the track, we have this loud sub bass going, which isn't as complicated as the human voice and have her stop and say, let's bring it back to 140 or whatever. Um, and then boom, we hit that part there. You as a listener are like, what the f is happening right now. Not only that, but all the constant changes in song style and sound is going to make it that much more interesting to you. So we can go ahead and maybe look at one more example here. Let's listen to this breakdown and see what happens. Yeah, it's just really interesting dynamically what's going on for a track that's totally squashed as this Girls' Generation track is at least in the mastering stage. But what they've done with the dynamics in these little uh, transition areas is unlike anything I've ever really seen, except in pop music. Because in pop music, you need to make your point very quickly. You need to make your point in like three and a half minutes or the average listener is going to get bored and turn the station. With this song, it's hard to get bored. And you kind of are listening to be like, like, where am I going to be taken next? And obviously, we know with Gangnam Style and how popular that was, personally, I think that track was very popular because of the video that was associated with it and the insanity of that. Really, as a track, it's going to take some of the same things you'll find in here with just sort of the catchiness of some of the lines and some quick style change-ups, but it is nothing like this Girls' Generation track, which I have to say is... Like I said before, the craziest track I think I've ever listened to. So let's just do this one more time. Don't stop. Let's bring it back to 140. But then that time when they go through and say the let's bring it back to 140, it goes to something totally different. So I'm going to stop it there because I've gone on long enough. But I just want you guys to listen to all these tracks, listen to the dynamic changes in them. And let me know if you have any questions, of course. Let's just look through these again just so you can see the huge, the, the differences here. It's absolutely insane. And they're all going to impact you differently as a listener, and they're all done intentionally, okay? That's the big point here. Understand the dynamics of a track. Understand how the energy is working in these tracks, and a lot of this is going to make sense to you, and it's going to help you a ton in your own music. So if anyone wants me to make that video on K-pop and J-pop, uh, I would be more than happy to do it, but I assume that would be only something I would want to do. Uh, but anyway, it's a very fascinating topic. So thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you in the next lesson.